Lake Tin, Norway. A team of underwater archaeologists is on the trail of one of the great mysteries of World War II. Coming There's something in. there, isn't it? This is the wreck of the Hydro. In February 1944, this ferry was carrying a secret cargo to the heart of the Third Reich. But the Hydro never made it. Boy, that thing is absolutely mangled. The Allies sank the Hydro because they feared that what was on board could make a reality of their worst nightmare, a Nazi nuclear bomb. For as Hitler prepared to plunge Europe into war, the German army was the first to begin researching nuclear weapons. In the race for the atomic bomb, the Nazis had a head start. So why didn't they win? The answer is about to emerge from the icy depths of Lake Tin. Hitler's sunken secret. For 60 years, the icy waters of Norway's Lake Tin have held a secret. Today, its peaceful shores show little sign of the conflict that raged here in World War II. But under Nazi occupation, this region witnessed a deadly underground war of spies and saboteurs. The battle was for one thing above all, Norway's heavy water. A mysterious substance that the Norwegian resistance fought desperately to keep out of German hands. In 1944, a final huge shipment was bound for Berlin. In a desperate act of sabotage, a passenger ferry supposedly carrying barrels of heavy water was sent to the bottom of Lake Tin. Now, a team of underwater archaeologists are looking for those barrels. They want to know what's really inside them. Do they contain the key to the only weapon that could have won the war for Hitler? A Nazi nuclear bomb. The story begins in 1940. On April the 9th, Nazi Germany invaded Norway, a small country that had maintained peaceful neutrality for 125 years. Taken by surprise, the Norwegians could offer little resistance. As opposition crumbled, the Germans headed straight for the remote area around Lake Tin to take control of Norway's most valuable industrial enterprise. High in the mountains at the head of the Rukan Valley was the Vermork hydroelectric plant, the world's largest hydroelectric power station. The Norsk Hydro Company used that power to make ammonia, the basis of fertilizer and explosives, both vital to the German war effort. But inside the Norsk hydro plant was a room of specialized equipment that made something else. Where are we here then? Well, look here, the original stuff, the high concentration cells. Physicist and historian Per Dahl is an expert on what happened here during World War II. We are really looking here at the piece of history the original high concentrations cells for producing heavy water. Heavy water was a strange new form of water that had only recently been discovered, and Norsk Hydro were making small quantities to supply scientists around the world who were investigating its properties. 
No one knew why, but as soon as they took over the plant, the Germans set about increasing production. They doubled the production apparatus, expanding the high concentration cells from the initial nine to 18, doubling the production. By 1942, they were seeking a tenfold increase in the production of heavy water. At the same time, the security around the plant in Rukan uh, was drastically uh, heightened as well. But every move the Germans made was being watched. A group of us, particularly the organized labor at the factory, wanted to create a movement to fight the Germans underground. Knut Leer Hansen became a key member of the secret resistance movement, and they began to worry about the developments at Vermorg. The heavy water, we had no idea at all what it really was and why the Germans paid so much attention to it. It had to be something important. So the resistance communicated what they had learned to British intelligence in London. The home forces had established a radio station so there was a steady stream of messages sent to England by radio. To the British, the developments at Vermorck were deeply alarming. They knew something the Norwegians didn't. Heavy water could be used to make nuclear explosives. It looked as if German scientists were trying to build an atomic bomb. If I were a physicist in London and realized what was going on in Norway uh, in, with the heavy water business, I would have been mighty worried. So began two years of secret warfare as the Allies tried to thwart the manufacture of heavy water. Norwegian commandos blew up the plant, but the Germans had it working again within three months. In November 1943, the US 8th Air Force bombed for Mork. But the heavy water plant survived. Eventually, in 1944, the resistance learned that the entire production plant and 15 tons of partially purified heavy water was to be shipped to Germany. They contacted London. What were they to do? The reply was swift stop the heavy water reaching Germany. But how? With only days to plan, it fell to Knut and his group to find a way. The plant was closely guarded, but on its journey to Berlin, the heavy water would be transported down the Rukan Valley by train. It would then travel the length of Lake Tin by ferry. I personally thought that the only place that they would never be able to recover the barrels from would be the bottom of Lake Tin. But the saboteurs knew that sinking the ferry would almost certainly mean the death of friends and neighbors. Could a few barrels of water really be that important? They sent a message to London. Doubt whether the effect of the operation is worth the reprisals, which must be reckoned on. Stop. As we cannot decide how important the operation is, we request a reply soonest, if possible, this evening. London replied immediately. Matter has been considered, and it is decided that it is very important to destroy the heavy water. Stop. Hope it can be done without too great misfortune. Stop. We send our best wishes for success in the work. A message came back that this plan should be carried out, the heavy water destroyed once and for all, unambiguously put, regardless of the loss of life. So we started the operation. In a 1947 Norwegian film, 
Knut and his colleagues reenacted that daring mission. We studied drawings of the ferry. At the bottom was a hatchway leading to the bilges. We unscrewed the floor cover to place a time bomb at the bottom of the ferry. Early the next morning, the railway flat cars with their cargo of barrels rolled on board the ferry. Meanwhile, in the hold, the improvised time bomb still ticked away. The hydro was due to sail at 9.30, but just before 10 o'clock, it still had not left the dock. The ferry's delay meant that Halvard Askit and his fiancée, Sulve, just got there in time. We were late. We were celebrating my birthday, so we had to run the last bit to get the ferry on time. Finally, at 10 o'clock, the ferry set sail. We had cake and food from my parents, and we were sitting downstairs in the saloon. Suddenly there was a bang. The boat was shaking. We thought we'd hit something. The ferry was rapidly filling with smoke and water. Halvard was faced with a terrible dilemma. His fiancée couldn't swim. Solveig uh, wanted me to jump. She knew she couldn't swim, but I told her she would have to jump. She said, OK, you first, and I'll follow. I jumped, but she just stayed there and went down with the boat. Fourteen local people drowned in the icy waters of the lake. But in all other respects, the mission seemed to be a complete success. The ferry and its cargo sank just where the saboteurs had planned, in the deepest part of the lake, where nothing could ever be recovered. I was so elated. I'd never run so fast so that we could get a message to England. It was as if I had angels' wings. That's how fast I ran, just to inform them that the operation had been successful. And the congratulatory telegrams started coming in. But mixed with the congratulations was concern. The Germans did not seem to feel that there was any reason to protect the shipment. They just sent it on its way. And the chief engineer at Wehrmurk had also not heard anything about a German guard for this transport. London was suspicious. Had it all been too easy? With regard to the ferry, please make absolutely sure that the barrels on it were not dummy ones substituted by the Germans. Stop. Did the Germans in fact fool the Norwegian resistance? After the war, it became clear that some barrels containing heavy water had indeed made it to Berlin. What really went down with the hydro? And what was the real significance of the heavy water? This is one of the last great mysteries of World War II, and there's only one way to solve it. To investigate, marine underwater archaeologist Brett Fanouf. 
I'm fascinated by World War II and mostly what I'm fascinated by is that it's within living memory and yet there's so many discrepancies. And in this case, there are some really glaring inconsistencies in what really was on the hydro. Where was it really headed? Why was it so easy to scuttle? All these things that don't add up. So we want to find out, is it really heavy water? You know? And if it is, was it all of the heavy water? Or is there some heavy water that went somewhere else? And the only way to do that is to go back and look. That means five tons of specialized equipment and operating in one of the world's deepest lakes. So Brett's recruited a Norwegian team with experience of these waters. And there's Johnny who is just a boundless ball of energy. You can't contain him, um, always optimistic. So he's been really excited about telling the whole story for Norway. It was touching, you know, a very big part of the history. And suddenly, me and Torvald, small locals, you know, found out that this is the starting of the race for nuclear weapon. And then we've got Tor, who's the typical stoic sort of Norwegian, you know, obviously in charge when you see him out on the lake. And then there's Frederick, who's my partner in crime. We think up the crazy missions together and figure out how to get it all to the field so we can tell these stories. But what was its condition? That was very good condition. Was it good? Yeah. All right. Crucial to the success of their mission are the team's remotely operated vehicles, the ROVs. From eyewitness reports of the sinking, they have a good idea of where to start looking for the hydro. Tor prepares to dive. It will take about 20 minutes for the ROV to descend to the bottom of Lake Tin. You can see how steep the mountains are, and basically it just continues like that underwater. So we're 300 meters from shore, but it's 400 meters deep. So it's more than a 45 degree slope to depth. A cloud of sediment signals the ROV's safe arrival on the bottom of the lake. There we go. They begin searching the lake bed. Suddenly the sonar starts to pick up a distinctive shape. This is the sonar image of the shipwreck, so it shows us we are about 25 meters away from the ship, so it should come into view on the video screens in a few seconds actually, so we're closing in as you can see. There we go! Oh, look at that, this is beautiful. It's a big ship. Can you still read the name? Can you see text? Hello. <laughs> it looks fantastic. It's in great shape. So where are we? Right at the bridge there? Yeah. It's so strange to see a wreck in a lake as opposed to the ocean that's just completely clean. In the ocean, you know, you get so much fuzz on the wreck and there's just nothing on this at all. See that lantern there? Yeah. It's nice. 60 years. I think it's still working if you pick it up. The ferry is in remarkable condition, but so far there's no sign of its cargo of barrels. Barrels that supposedly contain heavy water. If the team do manage to find and salvage one, they'll need to analyze its contents 
So Brett has asked physicist Professor Dave Walk, an expert in the nuclear properties of heavy water, to join them in Norway. Before the outbreak of war, the manufacture of heavy water was just a sideline for Norsk Hydro. It came about because to make chemical fertilizer, they needed hydrogen, and that they made from water. Norsk Hydro were using hydroelectricity to make hydrogen. It's actually not a very hard thing to do. If you pass electricity through water, which is H2O, you can break it apart into hydrogen and oxygen. So, as you can see, we're collecting hydrogen here in this test tube, which is basically all that Norsk Hydro were doing, just on a vastly larger scale. And then they'd take the hydrogen and use it to make fertilizer. But a few years before the war, scientists made an extraordinary discovery. A new kind of hydrogen. One where the nucleus contained an extra neutron, making it heavier. Scientists called it deuterium. And just like normal hydrogen, deuterium combined with oxygen to make a new kind of water. Heavy water. We call it heavy water for a very simple reason. I've got some heavy water here that we've frozen into heavy ice, and if I just drop it in this glass of ordinary water, you can see it sinks straight to the bottom. Now, heavy water is actually present in ordinary water. It's about 0.01%. Or in other words, in this five liters of ordinary water, there's about that much heavy water. And one of the side effects of, of the process of breaking up water into oxygen and hydrogen is the heavy water is very slightly harder to break up than, than the light water. And so you end up with the water that's left behind having a slightly higher concentration of heavy water. And if you do this again and again and again and again and again and again and again, you can eventually end up with this which is essentially pure heavy water. This is from Norsk Hydro. It's 99.76% pure heavy water. It was for this seemingly harmless substance that Norwegian resistance sank the hydro. That's not a barrel, is it? What is that? Is it pipe? Oh, a stack, okay. As Tor maneuvers the ROV around the wreck of the hydro, the team can begin to piece together the last desperate moments of the civilian passengers. Wait, is this the first class section? All right, okay, okay. it's got four windows, just like on the... So we're here then? We're on the starboard side of the wreck? Yep. Okay. The ceiling have been... Uh, oh, the ceiling's gone. You can see the doors where the people was fighting to get out. Uh, oh, we're right at the... It's the bow. Oh it's, the, oh, it's going down into the setup. Look at that. So the whole forward part of the ship sort of disappears. It's amazing. After the explosion, the ferry sank bow first, and the saloon where Halvard Askit and his fiancée were sitting is now buried in the lake bed. In the confusion, Halvard had left his fiancée for dead. But miraculously, Sulve survived and witnessed what happened to some of the cargo. I was probably dragged under by the undertow from the boat, and I somehow ended up getting caught in the propeller. I was badly cut and bruised, and the second time I emerged, I managed to grab hold of the lifebuoy crate. I couldn't see a lot, but I did see a barrel next to me, although I have no idea what was in it. A man was trying to get up onto it, but he didn't manage, and he drowned. Eventually, Sulve was picked up by a fishing boat and taken to the same farm as her fiancé, Halvard. <coughs> Hard to describe such a moment. It's not really possible. Sulve's account confirms that barrels were indeed aboard the hydro. But where are they now? And if they floated, 
They can't have been full of heavy water. Are we very close to the stern now? Or is that a rail car there? Is that, oh, that's one of the flat cars, okay. Boy, that thing is absolutely mangled though. Yeah. All the wood's gone on it. Or is, it, is that the underside we're looking at? Yeah. I see, okay, so it's flipped over. We've just seen one of the rail cars it's sort of flipped upside down and sort of mangled up a little bit. The flat cars should have been loaded with the barrels, but everything has been badly crushed. Then the team get their first glimpse of the cargo. Here's some barrel, crashed barrel here. The barrel has been broken open. No one will ever know what it originally contained. But then, a little further on, the ROV discovers more barrels. Two barrels lying on the seafloor. Look at that. So that one's wedged under. I wonder how many other got under the wreck when it sank. They don't look in bad shape. Yeah, they seem to be in good shape. But the wreck of the Hydro is a Norwegian war grave. Tor decides that these barrels are too close to be disturbed. Encouraged by finding barrels which seem to have survived the sabotage, the team start to search the area around the wreck, hoping to find another intact barrel which might still contain heavy water. But why were the Germans and Allies so obsessed with this seemingly harmless substance? The answer lies in a discovery made by German scientists on the eve of the war. A discovery which would have momentous consequences. The story of nuclear energy really starts in 1938 in Berlin when German physicists found that if you have a uranium nucleus and you hit it with a neutron, you can split it apart or fission it into two smaller nuclei, releasing quite a bit of energy. Now the key point is in addition to energy, it also releases more neutrons, which can fission more uranium, releasing more neutrons, fissioning more uranium, causing a chain reaction which in principle can release vast amounts of energy. Now this opened up the very worrying possibility, which was clear to physicists right away, of making nuclear explosives of tremendous power. Hitler's armies were already on the march through Europe. Physicists worldwide suddenly realized there will be a race to develop nuclear weapons. If Germany won it, nothing could stop the Nazis. Professor Mark Walker is an expert in German wartime nuclear research. Certainly was reason for the Allies to have fear about a German nuclear weapons project. Although many excellent scientists fled Hitler's Germany in 1933, Germany still had very good physicists. Among the best was a the theoretical physicist Werner Heisenberg. He'd helped create quantum mechanics in the 1920s, won a Nobel Prize for it. Heisenberg was obviously a brilliant scientist. And if nuclear weapons were possible, then he was good enough to get the job done to actually help Germany make a nuclear weapon. On the eve of World War II, the German military were the first to begin a secret nuclear research program. Recruited along with Heisenberg was his brilliant young protege, Karl Friedrich von Weizsäcker. Working together, Heisenberg and von Weizsäcker soon made a crucial discovery. Before the war, scientists had realized that you couldn't make a nuclear bomb from ordinary uranium. But the two German physicists worked out how, in theory, you could turn uranium into the raw material for a bomb. Well, the Germans recognized that natural uranium cannot be used as an explosive but you can put it in a nuclear reactor, you can have a sustained, controlled nuclear fission chain reaction, and what happens is that the natural uranium, some of it is transformed into element 94, a transuranic element we now call plutonium, 
and plutonium is a nuclear explosive. But the Germans were not the only ones to work out a theoretical route to the atom bomb. British scientists came to the same conclusion, and when America entered the war in December 1941, the two allies pooled their scientific resources in the vast Manhattan Project. People tend to think of the Manhattan Project as a few, you know, physicists on a mesa in New Mexico. In fact, it had the largest industrial facility ever built in the world, the gaseous diffusion plant at Oak Ridge. It included the huge reactor facilities at Hanford, facilities at Berkeley and Chicago. And it was bigger than the U.S. auto industry of the time. It spent a huge amount of money. It was really an enormous effort. But the Allied scientists knew all their work would be in vain if the Germans got there first. However, German progress depended on a steady and growing supply of heavy water. Heavy water, which British intelligence and their Norwegian allies were determined they would not get. At the dive site, the team have met with success. They found a barrel which looks intact, and they're getting ready to lift it as Dave arrives. Hi. Hi there, I'm Dave. Brett, how are you? Yes. Hello, Frederick. Pleased to meet you. Pleased to meet you. Uh, we have found nine barrels so far. One on the ship and then eight on the lake floor around the ship. Two very close to the shipwreck. Uh, and we have selected uh, the one that looks the best. That's uh, about 60 meters away from the shipwreck itself. And it looks complete and we hope that it will contain heavy water. So we're heading for that one now. Huh? There we are coming There's something in. there, isn't it? Yes, it's a barrel. It's the end of it. Oh, yeah. There yeah, I that's the barrel. <laughs> yes. Can you read anything on the end? Is the five it? upside down? Five? Or? I don't know. Well, See, yeah, it could yeah. be. Hmm? Uh. To lift the barrel, a specially designed grapple has been attached to one of the ROVs. Tor has to position it in exactly the right place over the rim of the barrel. This is just once. You get one try? Yes, one try. it's only one try. Okay. Cross your fingers. Yes, we do. <laughs> Contact. Oops. No. Where is it? It slipped off. Yeah. You uh, you have enough tether out. It's like on the tether. Can you take the cable? I see there from. Okay. Oh, there. It's tight there. The next delicate step is to let go of the grapple. Easy, easy there, there, there. We are. and we're off. Okay, and then the connector is hanging. You can see the connector yeah. hanging there, so we have to so now backs <laughs> pull, pull out that one too. Okay. Now it's and we're there off. We this is the point of no return. No there. there. No, it either comes way. or it doesn't. Okay. When, I, when I pull it up. Uh, yeah. The barrel is buried deep in the mud. They'll have to pull very hard to get it out. Okay, they're pulling. No sign of any movement yet. Oh. No. Can they tell how much force they're putting on with that winch? No, not exactly. Mm -hmm. Suddenly it will just go. Pop free. Yeah, it will pop free, so it's hard to say exactly when it's going to happen. So, there is a slight movement in it, so... Okay, there, come no, out, it's come coming, in. it's coming! <laughs> <laughs> okay, off it goes! Boom, goodbye! <laughs> barrel on a bungee. Yeah. Yep. And did you see the bottom of the barrel when it came yeah. out? The oh, paint yeah. was still yes. on it. Yep. Yep. <laughs> <laughs> Don't drop it. The underwater cameras on the ROV provide the first close-up pictures of the barrel in 60 years. It looks intact, but the smallest of holes is enough to contaminate any heavy water it may contain with lake water. Luckily, the electrolysis process which originally separated the heavy water 
should have left traces which will allow Dave to test for contamination. The barrels contain heavy water, we hope, uh, but to make the heavy water, to separate it originally, they had to add something else to make the water conduct electricity. They added something called potash lye, which is actually potassium hydroxide, which will make the water very caustic. Now, we measure whether water is caustic or not on a scale called pH. Well, now we're going to want to know whether the pH in the barrel is different than the pH of the lake water, so I have to know what the pH of the lake water is. So now I'm going to test it and find out. Okay, now, now you can see it's about 9, which is a little higher than you expect for ordinary water, but still much less than you would expect for the material in the barrel, which should have a pH of about 14. So when we open up a barrel, if it's 14, it's probably uncontaminated. If it's 9, it's just lake water. barrel in very good shape, I think. We have secured the barrel with two straps because we couldn't lift it out of the water with this hook that we put on it. That would be too much stress on the barrel. Uh, it's still going to be quite a bit of stress on the barrel as we lift it through the water hole. Take that very, very slowly, make sure it's, it doesn't bump it and things like that. It was absolutely fascinating to actually see that barrel come up. You think of the Second World War as something that happens in grainy old movies from your dad's era. You don't think of it as something immediate. And to see the actual barrel come up out of the water is an amazing experience. But can you see the number here now? Can we see here? Yes, it's 26. Now it's perfect, the corrosion goes at one angle and the dirt goes at another and there's a little clear sector left and the 26 is right in the middle of it like it was planned that way. Yeah, it's good. But you know nothing is pouring out and it's full of something. Well we've got the barrel uh, and we can clearly read the number on the end of it which is fantastic. It's barrel number 26. But the question is have the contents of the barrel been contaminated with lake water? Oh, it's coming. Oh, Whoa. It's coming up, Dave. Yeah, just go very slowly. Let it release the pressure. I think it's, it's amazing. Moving. It comes up on the take off the lid. Yeah. Yes, <laughs> yes, take off the take off the lid, yes. The gasket is good still, you know. Ah, yeah, they built them good back then. Yeah. Okay. Oh, look Very here. good. Look here. It's still boiling. boiling. Be careful here. What? Careful, careful, careful. Precautions are being taken here. Potassium hydroxide is very, very caustic. It looks clear. There it is. This, I think, is good stuff, Dave. Yeah, it, it looks you know, good. It's not like water, you know, it's a bit more uh, softer or viscosity. I'm now going to measure the pH. Just put this meter in the solution and wait a few moments for it to equilibrate. <laughs> it's good stuff. 14, that's your guess. What's 14. <laughs> You're satisfied? Yeah. Yes! yes! <laughs> Very good. 60 years. It's exactly the way it was the day they put it in yes. there. I will be damned. <laughs> yes, you will. Okay. <laughs> Shake hands with this. I don't want to get a kiss, no. <laughs> <laughs> Fantastic. So they sank it and uh, believed. It should never come to the surface again. Everybody says <laughs> it's gone forever. But after 60 years, it's still are, you know. Well, I mean, it's an incredible feeling. There was a heck of a lot of work to get this. So we have to get this back to the lab in London so we can find out what the purity of the heavy water really is. Because, amazingly, the barrel's number is still legible, Dave will be able to do far more than just check if it contains heavy water. In the archives of Norsk Hydro, Per Dahl has found documents which list the entire shipment which was supposedly aboard the Hydro when it sank. 
here is a list of the various barrels transported on the hydro ferry and the amount of heavy water in each of those barrels in various concentrations. According to this manifest, the concentration of heavy water in barrel 26 was just 1%. To detect such a low concentration will require careful analysis. At Imperial College London, Dave and his colleagues compare the infrared spectrum of the water molecules from the barrel with the spectra of test samples of different known concentrations of heavy water. We've tested the samples of heavy water here at Imperial quite a few times, and we can say with considerable confidence that that water is enriched in heavy water. The result is unequivocal. It's about 1.1% plus or minus 0.2% heavy water, which, interestingly, is pretty much exactly what the manifest said it would be. So one mystery about the hydro has been forever laid to rest. We've learned there really was heavy water on the hydro. Any speculations that the Germans had pulled some sort of swap are just not true. The shipping manifest appears to be largely correct. And if that's so, it helps to clear up another puzzle. The manifest shows that the low-numbered barrels which contained the high concentration of heavy water were little more than half full. That explains why some of them floated. It was probably these barrels, recovered by the Germans, which ended up in Berlin. But that raises a new and troubling question. It's clear from the manifest that most of the barrels contained only very dilute heavy water. Despite the apparent size of the shipment, the total quantity of pure heavy water was quite small. The Germans would have needed a total of about five tons of heavy water to get a heavy water reactor, nuclear reactor, running. The list here informs us essentially that about half a ton of heavy water was being transported to Germany. So the hydro was carrying far too little heavy water for even one reactor, let alone the ten or more that would have been needed to make enough plutonium for a nuclear weapon. So were the Allies right in their belief that the heavy water was destined for a bomb project? Did the Germans in fact want it for some other purpose? Within a few months of the sinking of the Hydro, Allied armies were advancing across Europe. Following closely behind the frontline troops was a secret operation codenamed ALSOS. Its mission was to find a Nazi nuclear weapons program the Allies were sure must exist. For months, ALSOS scoured newly liberated Europe and found nothing. Then, just days before the final German surrender, there came to Heikelok, a small town in southern Germany. Beneath the Baroque church there was a cave, and inside they found the intended destination of the Norwegian heavy water. A makeshift laboratory with a single experimental reactor that German scientists still had not got working. The Nazi nuclear bomb, which had inspired so much fear, turned out to be a mirage. There was no German equivalent of the Manhattan Project. The reason, believes historian Mark Walker, can be found in a decision made in early 1942, just at the time when the Allies were also deciding whether to embark on the vast Manhattan Project. In early 1942, precisely when the Allies are getting concerned about Norwegian heavy water, American officials and German officials make crucial decisions about their nuclear weapons projects. Interestingly, scientists in both countries said the same thing. The scientific results were essentially the same. Scientists in both countries said, it'll take a couple years, but nuclear weapons are possible. Now in America, it was assumed that the war is going to take a long time. These weapons would be done before the end of the war, therefore we have to try to make them. In Germany, it was assumed that if we don't win the war quickly, we will lose. These weapons might be interesting for the future, but they're no help to us now. 
it would be a waste of energy, money, and time to try to make them. So German nuclear research was transferred to civilian control. The hydro shipment was destined for an experimental reactor project. It was of no military significance, which is why it was only lightly guarded. So it seems that the doubts the Norwegian resistance expressed about the value of sinking the hydro were justified. It turns out that they understood better than Allied intelligence just how relatively unimportant the shipment really was. I would say that the Allies were not paranoid as such. Uh, rather, they were surprisingly uninformed about what was going on in Germany in nuclear physics. The German program was very leaky. They were telling journalists in cafes what they were up to. And yet, the Allies don't seem to have made much of an effort to really penetrate this program and learn more about it. Um, I would call that a, a critical intelligence failure. None of this, of course, takes away from the heroism of Knut Lea Hansen and his comrades. They chose to take up arms against a brutal invader at great risk to themselves. They knew their actions would lead to the death of innocent civilians. But the bitter truth is that World War II, like all modern wars,